This lecture is the big picture of calculus, and it's motivated by a single equation. So we begin with an object, omega, and typically this is a function or maybe a package of functions. And it's in differential form, which means it has to have a you know, differential, d omega. And we're going to integrate both sides. And on the left-hand side, we're going to integrate over some kind of region. And on the right-hand side, we're going to integrate over the boundary of that region. And I'll write that in, in red. So boundary of the region. And when we do that, we have equality. And this is the general fundamental theorem of calculus. So let's box this and put it in the upper right-hand corner. Okay, there it is. Now there are six theorems that support this general equation. The first is single variable calculus. We'll do that very quickly. And we'll do that one in brown. And the way it works is, quickly, if we have an object, which is a function, the differential for that object would be the derivative of that function. Say it looks like that. Okay, so object differential. The region is this line segment, and it's bounded by these points, A and B. So we'll call them A and B. Okay. The fundamental theorem says, let's take the differential, f prime, integrate it over the region. Well, the region is a to b, a to b, and we need a dx here to make this work, equals, well, the integral over the boundary. Well, the boundary are just points, and points have no dimension. So when you integrate something that has no dimension, you just take the value of that object at those boundary points. So we have f of b minus f of a. So this is, for single variable calculus, the fundamental theorem, the integral of the rate of change is total change. Now in multivariable calculus, in purple, we have five theorems. <coughs> so what we're going to do is we're going to take that line segment from A to B, pick it up, stretch it, curve it, bend it, and put it in three-dimensional, what we call ambient space. So let's draw it on the whiteboard. But this is really in three-dimensional space. So here's your curve. And it's bounded, red, by points say A and B. Okay, we need orientation, so we need some kind of direction. Um, we need a vector field, so we have a, a vector field F here, and we need a unit tangent vector, unit tangent vector, and we need a piece of this arc length, and that will be d little s for the differential of arc length. Okay, we have all the parts, except we don't have a, a differential yet. <clears throat> so what we do is we take an object called a potential function, just a scalar function, and we take the gradient of that function, and that's going to be our vector field. So this is our differential. So we take our differential, gradient of f. We're going to integrate it over the region. Well, it's a one-dimensional curve. That's the region. So we have a curve here. Now, this is a vector. All right. So to complete the symbol of integration, we have to dot it with t d little s. Basically, we're taking f and dotting it with 
the unit tangent stretched to the appropriate length, vs, symbolically anyway, and that's equal to, well, red, well, in red is the boundary point, and we say when we integrate over something that has no dimension, you just take the object, the anti-gradient, at those points. And subtract. So it's very much like single variable calculus. We call this the fundamental theorem of line integrals, and I prefer to call it the gradient theorem. All right, next dimension up is to take that line or curve in space and to stretch it to give it another dimension. So when you take a curve and stretch it, it becomes a surface. So the surface in purple looks maybe like something like that. So this is a surface. We still have our vector field. Okay. We need to orientate things again. So we do that with a unit normal vector. That kind of indicates which way it is up or out, whatever you prefer. We need a patch of area, a d big S, a differential of surface area. And what else do we need? We need a boundary in red. Well, the surface is bounded by this curve, necessarily closed curve. We have a curve, we have our unit tangent. We have our piece of arc length, and we have all the pieces now except for the differential. The differential in this environment is curl, and the symbol is del cross f. Remember, curl just is a vector that measures um, it measures maximum rotation. So it measures things like uh, torque or angular velocity. So it's a vector. This is our differential. So we start with that, del cross f. We're going to integrate it over the region. Well, the region is a two-dimensional. So we have two squiggly lines. And the region is a surface. Again, this is a vector, so we have to dot it with the appropriate uh, value here, well that's the unit normal stretched to the differential of surface. <coughs> and again, it's not really stretched because differentials are infinitesimally small. So, what's that equal to? Well, red, it's this, it's this curve, this closed curve, uh, with respect to the vector field F. So we have the line interval necessarily closed with a curve, and the object is the anti-curl. So it's F, and this is one dimensional, so we dot it with, well, unit T, the little s, as opposed to big s. All right, so we have Stokes' theorem. The next dimension is to take this surface, to close it, and fill it with um, stuff. So what does that look like? What does that look like? Uh, well, we have a solid now. We have a solid, some kind of uh, solid. So we need a symbol, we'll use S already, so we'll use W. We need a vector field. All right, we need to say which way it is out. So we need a unit normal. And that patch of surface, D big S. Um, well, this is a solid, so it has inside. So if you look inside with your microscope, 
you see these cube things, and these are differentials of volume, dx, dy, dz, in Cartesian coordinate uh, systems. And we need a boundary. Well, it's a solid, and it's bounded by the surface. So the boundary is the surface, S, and we're done, except we need the differential. So in this case, the differential is the gradient, not the gradient, I'm sorry, is the divergence del dot f, and it's a scalar. This is a scalar. Divergence just measures, um, if you think of f maybe as wind blowing different parts of um, space, Divergence measures how things are maybe stretching or compressing. Or if it was um, fluid dynamics, we say it's the divergence is the net of, of sources of water minus sinks of water. Anyway, it's a scalar. You get the idea. So we take, we take that differential, that d omega del dot f, and we have to integrate it over the entire region. Well, that's the whole solid, so we need, we need three squiggly lines over W. This is a scalar, so we're going we're gonna to multiply it, not dot it. We're going to regular multiplication, dV. And on the right-hand side, we have, we have this, the boundary, the surface. Well, what's going on at the surface with respect to this vector field F? Well, it's flux. It's that, it's that surface integral. So it's that double integral. And the object is the anti-divergence, F. And it's over the surface, two-dimensional. So we have to dot it with um, N dot D, D big X. So we call this the divergence theorem due to Gauss and others. And I think these are pretty neat. This one, for example, says if you want to know what's going on here at the surface with respect to some kind of vector field, if you want to know this answer, go inside of that solid and measure how things are, well, diverging, how they're changing and add them up. Okay, now there's one more theorem. It's called Green's Theorem. And it has two forms. One for tangents and one for normals. So Green's Theorem for tangents is really Stokes' Theorem, which is that surface, if we, if we flatten it out. So if we flatten this side out, then we have then we have that boundary in the plane this time. So it's in it's a boundary in the plane. So it's a curve. It's still a curve. It still has a unit tangent. It still has that element of arc length. And it's flat. So there's a there's a, a region here. So it's the same equation is that we have to modify the left hand side. Remember what this is, it's double integral curl dot whatever is appropriate. For green, we're going to do a flat Stokes. So the, it's still a double integral. But the curl, the vector curl, we have to dot it with the with the um, unit k vector to make it two dimensional. And when we do that, let's say you know the vector field f has components p, q, r, the scalar curl when you when you dot it with k becomes becomes partial. Partial Q with respect to X minus partial P with respect to Y times not D, um, DS or, or NDS, it's going to be simply DA. 
because it's over the region. So it becomes just a regular old double interval. But it's still curl. It's just scalar curl. Okay, that's called Green's theorem in the tangent form because we're measuring work or flow, whatever you like. Now, if we take the solid and flatten it, well, you get the same exact thing, except it's now in the normal sense. So we have to take that unit tangent vector, rotate it 90 degrees clockwise, so we get a unit normal vector. So the divergence theorem, when we flatten it, well, this stays the same. We're measuring flux across the curve in the plane. But this side, when we go from three to two dimensions, it changes color. Three squiggly lines turn into two squiggly lines. The divergence, which is just the sum of the three partials, turns into the sum, to the sum of the two partials. So it's partial p with respect to x, partial q with respect to y, times, well, it's still flat, so we still have a, you know, we still have a dA here, dx dy, so dA over the double integral associated with that region, and we're done. This is Green's theorem in the normal sense. I think of it as Green's theorem for flux in the plane. That's it. That's the big picture of calculus.